Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Towery and I'm the Copyright Officer here at University Libraries. And this presentation is going to be on author's rights, copyright and plagiarism. So those, that's a lot to cover. So um, I'll get right to it. Okay. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, author's rights. So th sometimes these are referred to as creator's rights in our policy. I think they're referred to as creator's rights, but it just means the right of the person who created the copyrightable material. So if you shoot the video, you created the video, you're the author of the video. Same thing for you're the author of the novel, um, things like that. So it doesn't really matter about format. You could be a songwriter, you'd be considered the author of the song. So that's what we're talking about here. And this comes up a lot because you are all creators. You're all authors of a lot of content, some related to your job and some outside of your job. And so I just want to cover what it is that you own um, that in the realm of copyright and the Texas state policy and also um, how to license your work that you create here. So um, and how to protect your work. We'll cover that too. So there's this idea in copyright and it's ensconced in US copyright law about what's called a work made for hire. And the default rule is that anything that you create, you're the author of, that's within the realm of copyrightability, you own the copyright too. So I created this presentation, I'm recording it. Um, I'm the author, normally I would own this. The exception is that if I am working for someone, my employer is going to own it if it's made in the scope of my employment. So because this is what I was hired to do, create presentations like this, the university owns this particular presentation. So that's what's known as a work made for hire. There's two ways to create works made for hire. One is to be creating works as an employee in the scope of my employment like this. And then another is um, what normally comes up in the realm of contract uh, labor. So I could be hired to create a work made for hire. So I could go out and hire someone to create a video for me. And I would put in the um, agreement that we had that it was going to be a work made for hire so that they wouldn't own the copyright. Um, that's very important so that if you work with um, students that you've hired for a project or um, an outside illustrator for a book you're making you and you want to control the copyright, you need to make sure that you have a work made for hire agreement or you may be able to use that work, but you don't control the copyright in it, and that copyright is going to be retained by um, that person. So that's the way that it comes up in um, this university setting most, most of the time. It's still fairly rare of a question. Um, the university policy is a little bit different, and I don't have a slide on that, but the university policy is very generous in that it gives to faculty and staff the um, right to own all of their scholarly work. So even though this is a work made for hire, when I write a paper and get it published, that work um, is actually owned by me. So I retain the right to that. And so um, that's also true of um, courses get a little bit different. It's true of courses, but the university retains um, the right to use those courses. So what, what happens is the university is um, taking a license back from anything that you create. So while you own the copyright in the course, um, the university can continue to use it um, with that license. So um, if you have any questions about that, 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 that comes up a lot. The policy's out there, but people don't um, people don't really read all of the policies. I know that this is true. And so sometimes they're unaware of like how the ownership works with things like that. Um, another thing to point out, if you have an internal or an external grant, or you're working with um, instructional designers here on campus, then the university is going to own that whatever work is created out of that. And that actually comes up and it can be a problem. So just a heads up, if you're, if you're working under a grant, 
the university is going to own the work um, product that comes out of that grant. Um, and there's some exceptions. It depends on the grantor, what their wishes are. And the university can always release it back to you. Um, it does become a problem if you're continuing to do research. So that's kind of a research um, issue. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, about that um, together with the Office of Research and Commercialization. So the, there are people who can help you with all of those kind of questions. Um, the next thing I wanted to cover is how can you protect your own work? Um, if it's a scholarly piece of work, we always recommend that you use what's called the SPARC addendum. That stands for Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, SPARC, and they are out there trying to um, get everyone to protect their own work and to publish open access um, whenever they can. So there's something called the SPARC addendum and it's a very short um, clauses that you can add to any contract you have with the publisher that's at who's asking you to transfer your copyright. Most journals, traditional journals, if you publish in them, they're going to ask you to transfer all of your copyright to them when they publish the article. You can include this spark addendum and we have created our own sort of version of it. It's right here on this slide that allows you to do certain things with it. So you can post it in the digital collections, you can put it on your website, and it can be used in teaching. So you can post a copy of it on Canvas. Um, so I always like to put that in there. So another thing that you can do with your own work, and this is true even if it's a work made for hire under our university policy, you can place an open license on that work. And that's true of your own work that you own outside of the scope of that work made for hire. So you could put it on your courses you developed, um, you could put it on your scholarly work, um, and you can also um, place it on works that would be works made for hire, like something like this. I can place an open license. And what those open licenses allow people to do is if I say, you can use this, I'm gonna place an open license on it, then people can use it without having to ask my permission. They can reuse it, they can share it, they can um, take parts of it and put it in their course. They can remix it um, you can do anything like that with it. They just have to give me attribution because that's the kind of license I, I chose. And the best way to license textual, video, music, anything like that, anything other than software, um, the best way to license that is to use something called Creative Commons license or something similar. There are other open licenses out there, but this is the biggest schema that we have. I have a link to it here. I'm not gonna hop out to it. Um, uh, it's a great resource. They have a lot of um, explanatory videos and um, infographics and um, educational kind of materials and also like, you know, help you choose your license, wizards, things like that. What Creative Commons is, is it's a, um, it's a company, a nonprofit that developed a series of licenses that people could borrow or use and affix to their own work to show other people that um, they could use them so that people could share them more openly. It's something you don't have to go to an attorney. You don't have to get your own paperwork. You can just put the icon on there and it tells everybody you're free to use this as long as you attribute me. And we'll take a look at the licenses on the next couple slides. Um, there's another component to the Creative Commons licenses, and that's the machine readable component. So these are used in a lot of um, third party websites um, uh, like Flickr and Google Images uses it. Um, Creative Commons itself has an image search, um, SoundCloud, there's a lot of music sharing sites. Um, anywhere where things can be downloaded. Um, they're actually using some of this uh, Creative Commons machine readable component so that they, you can filter by the license itself. And um, I do another a set of presentations on how to do that. If you're interested, um, just look on sign up to get into the details of that. So Creative Commons, this is what it looks like. So this icon down here, <clears throat> the gray icon, that's the icon that you use if you want to share something and you just want attribution. So anybody can use it however they like. They just have to give you attribution. And we'll talk a little bit about what constitutes attribution. Um, but they're free to share and adapt it. And I can't take it back. 
right? So that's that's kind of you don't you don't have to worry about it. If you see that something with this license out there, you're free to use it. You just have to remember to attribute. So that's the basic, that's the basic license. It's the most open license, but there are a series of six licenses. And um, uh, they go from the top uh, left corner here, they go from the most open to the bottom right corner to the, the most restrictive. So, um, you know, I can, uh, I do have another presentation uh, that is a little bit more in depth on these. So look for that if you're really interested, but it, it's just a way of restricting the use so that you're only allowing the kind of use that you feel comfortable with. And um, I'm available to answer any questions about this. Um, I always recommend people use the, the most two most open attribution um, CC by or attribution share alike. And the share alike is just slightly different in that if someone uses your material and is remixing it, um, then they have to uh, license their work um, just as openly or more openly. So this is a concept that comes from a uh, copy left, the copy left open sharing and software. Um, and a lot of copy left licenses are just like this. So you're free to use this material, but if you use it, um, then you have to open your work in a similar way. So um, there's a lot of nuances about how these interact. And one of the reasons that I recommend those two licenses is that some of these licenses aren't compatible. So if you are remixing a lot of things or you want your work to be reused and remixed, it's better to um, have a more open license. So one thing to think about licenses, and this includes the Creative Commons licenses, but it also includes any proprietary license, any kind of terms of use of a website. You, if you're using Disney Plus, um, Disney Plus has a license, YouTube has a license. Um, we're talking about anything that's digital is going to have some kind of a license. So um, if it's a book, it doesn't have a license, most cases. If it's um, a DVD, you think it doesn't have a license, it actually does have a, a small license. But most things that are analog don't have licenses and most things that are digital will have a license. Uh, it may not be explicit, but it's in there, it's embedded. Um, most of the time, if you're online, you can read what those licenses are on, under the terms of use at the very bottom of the page. And I will say that courts have up, upheld those, those are controlling. So you do need to abide by those licenses. And those licenses can change your rights under the default copyright rules. So if you think you have a right to fair use, we'll talk about that a little bit um, in the future. If you think you have a right to fair use, you may not because that license may say that you do not have a right to fair use to these materials. So it's very important that you read this fine print if you're gonna use something um, that's digital. Um, so it's just a warning out there. No one ever reads the fine print. Um, I do. So if you ever have a question about anything, I will read the terms and I'll try to interpret them or put them into plain language for you. So whenever you're using anything that's digital, um, always ask yourself, is there a license? And then what does the license say about how I can use it? So I uh, say I want to use, I want to show Disney Plus in my class. What does the license say? And it does say something about it, I, I guarantee you. And um, I answer a lot of questions about that where I go and I read the license and I tell you, um, does your license allow it? Does it not allow it? And um, yeah, so. so what are the consequences? People say, well, nobody can catch me, nobody knows. So you do have to think about um, if you do have a breach. So if you, um, if you use a Creative Commons license and you don't abide by the the requirements, if you don't attribute, for instance. Uh, Creative Commons has built in that that actually isn't considered a breach or you have a, it may be considered a breach, but you can correct that breach. So uh, the terms are still valid and you have sort of a, a, a period of time where you can go back and attribute. So if I find somebody out there using this online and I say, hey, you didn't attribute me, please attribute me. Um, and they go ahead and make that change, then that license is still in effect. But not every license works this way. Most of them, if you um, say you have a license to make 40 copies of something, right? And put them out online or 40 downloads. 
if you, and this is very common of like YouTube videos, so say you have a license to use a song 40 times, 40 downloads, and you, you download, you allow a thousand downloads. That's a breach of the license, right? So that's actually infringement. So not only do you have to pay for more licenses, you may have to pay damages in addition to that, right? So just be very careful. Another thing I wanna point out is can the vendor, can that, that company that owns that um, and is licensing the material, can they identify the breach? And this is becoming more and more um, easy to do uh, through technology. So for instance, you have on YouTube Content DM, which is, um, sort of a, an AI that scans the program, that scans the, the music that's being used. And it can tell if you're using um, a recorded music that's copyrighted, right? And it will just take it down and send you a notice, right? Um, it's that kind of thing. And um, plagiarism detection software, I'll talk about plagiarism a little bit later, but it's being used by publishers now. So um, just know that there's more out there. Um, the most recent thing that I've heard that is should be terrifying to people is that Elsevier is now um, has a technology where they embed into the metadata of a PDF when it's when it's downloaded that it shares back to Elsevier whenever that PDF is shared. Yeah, so um, fascinating. Um, I've even seen even if you think something's in a fi behind a firewall like tracks or canvas, there's ways of seeing if that material is actually being used there. Um, we had someone contact us who, um, they were a photographer and someone was using their um, photograph within tracks, within a tracks course. And um, it ended up being okay, but this, this is a person that makes her living off photography. Um, all we had to do was assure them that it was a fair use and um, an educational purpose and they were okay with it but um, they could have pressed the point. So that's just to say, don't think that you're safe because um, you may not be. So this uh, just some links about CopyLeft. I'll share um, the PowerPoints with you and I'll share um, the recording as well. Um, I covered it a little bit. There are some differences between uh, Creative Commons and CopyLeft and there's some all kinds of open licenses out there. So if you're in the software area, lots of different kinds of licenses and um, you can really go down a rabbit hole with these. So um, just to know, I, I do have a research guide on copyright and there's a tab um, about copyleft. So plagiarism. I was encouraged to um, include uh, education about plagiarism in all of my presentations because uh, there's sort of a widespread misunderstanding about plagiarism and what it is and how it's different from copyright. And so I do wanna talk just a little bit about plagiarism um, and I just have a couple slides. So there's a really easy way to avoid plagiarism um, and that is to attribute your sources. So um, anytime, you, um, anytime you use anybody's idea um, that wasn't yours, um, you gotta attribute it. So it, it, it's not just uh, anytime you paraphrase or quote somebody, it's whenever you're using their ideas as well. So it's broader than copyright in that respect. Um, it is an ethical breach um, and there's no exceptions to it. So I always encourage people to take very, very careful notes when they're looking at someone else's material um, because it's very easy to think that an idea is yours and um, you actually got it from someplace because you didn't keep very good notes. I mean, it happens all the time. A lot of times it's inadvertent, but it can still be kind of devastating. So um, that's the way to avoid it. Um, but people always ask, what does attribution mean? And in attribution in the Creative Commons licenses sense, and also in the plagiarism sense, it is very simple. It doesn't amount to citation. So all you need is a title, if there is one, an author, the source, so where you got it, and a, the license, if there is one. And sometimes it's just, I relied on fair use, or I use this with permission, I got permission. So just put that. Um, uh, a really handy thing, all the files in Wikimedia, which are all the images that are sourced for, for uh, Wikipedia, those all come with an attribution built in, so you can just copy that. And that's that third line there. Um, so that's a little handy thing. Attributions are also built into the Creative Commons um, image search. You can just 
uh, you like an image, you want to download it, they've already created the attribution for you. You just cut and paste it. So, so it's handy. So the difference between plagiarism and copyright is that plagiarism is purely about ethics. Um, in our context, it's academic dishonesty. It's a violation of the honor code. Um, and it can ruin your career. Um, there are no exceptions. Copyright is a legal concept. Um, there are plenty of exceptions that allow you to use somebody's copyrighted material without attribution. Um, and we'll talk about some of those. And um, uh, it's really uh, a money damages um, or an injunction. Someone can stop you from using it. Um, but just know that they're different. They overlap, but they're different. Um, if you read about copyright violations or infringements in the media, they always call it plagiarism, though. So copyright. We're going to briefly cover the really high level um, information about copyright. So copyright is an original work of authorship that's been fixed in a tangible medium. And every single word or concept in that definition is still litigated today. So it does have to be original. It can't be your grandmother's novel that she wrote that you want to copyright. Um, it has to be a work of authorship, right? That means it can't be, at least in this country, it can't be uh, created by artificial intelligence. So it can't be created by a computer. It can't be created by an animal. It has to be a human. Um, and it must be fixed. So um, if I wasn't recording this, my extemporaneous uh, ramblings about copyright would not be fixed enough to protect it. Um, so if you're doing improvisational dance, you might wanna have a notation or you might wanna have um, at least an outline and you may wanna record it when you do it, perform it. Uh, and a tangible medium, um, mostly this is considered like skin tattoos used to not be considered a tangible medium. I know it makes no sense, um, but um, uh, you have to be careful here, even the sand drawings, you know, the Buddhist monks that make the sand um, creations, um, those are, that's considered to be a tangible medium, even though it is ephemeral. So stuff still gets litigated. Um, copyright gives you exclusive rights. And that means that when you have a copyright in something, you have the right to exclude all others from doing something, right? And that is to copy it. Um, or duplicate it in any way and to make derivatives that means to modify it and share it or um, change it up and share it um, to share it that's distribute it um, and then depending on what it is to display or perform it right so one thing you have to ask is is it even copyrightable because copyright doesn't exist in all things um, so that some things are not copyrightable just they aren't so words and short phrases they may be protected by trademark and service marks, right? Um, ideas, ideas are not copyrightable. Um, the expression of ideas is copyrightable. So where, where expression starts from ideas is litigated, right? So um, the more specific something is, the more copyrightable it is. Methods or processes, methods or processes like a recipe is not copyrightable. It is, uh, protectable. If if it if it fits the definition of protection for patents, it can be patented, right? So, and it also can be protected by what's called as know-how or trade secrets. So you could um, lock that down with licenses. So that's one thing you can lock down your know-how with um, or your method with a license and not allow people to use it unless they license it. Um, and works that are not sufficiently original. So. Um, Facts are not um, copyrightable. Um, data by itself is not copyrightable. Um, so that's pretty important to know because it comes up when, when you think about what can I use that somebody else's. So uh, one of the big mistakes that people make is thinking that anything that is publicly accessible or publicly available on the internet is in the public domain. But the public public domain works, it's a very specific term of art, and it's a very, very small subset of material that's available for your use. So it means everything that is protected, um, that is created by the federal government, or everything that um, 
was published before a certain point in the United States. So once things are um, really old, you can start to use them again. Um, note that this is just a US government, it's not states and it's not local government, it's not quasi government organizations. And also um, these rules are not the same in every country. Um, Lisa, I see you have your hand up, but I'm, I'm gonna save questions until the end because I'm recording. Um, so just hold on to it or write it in the chat. Um, so the, you can see that this isn't gonna apply to everything, but if you do have something that's really old, then you don't need to worry about it. Um, so that's just something to know. If, you're, if most of your work is, is in you know, the 17th century, you're not gonna have to worry about copyright. Um, and you can use you know, satellite images that, the, that you know, NASA has created because those are US government work. So a lot of um, maps and things like that. So it's just something to keep in your mind but don't get in the habit of just borrowing things and using things from um, other, just that you find online because they're gonna be protected by copyright unless they're openly licensed. So look for that license and see if you can um, uh, take advantage of it. Um, linking is usually gonna be okay. So if you're linking to something, this may, this may be sort of a, a new thing to everybody, but if you're just including links to something or you're embedding a video in your, your Canvas site, you're really not implicating copyright. Um, just know, keep in the back of your mind that this may change, that this is being sort of contested in the courts. And um, we have sort of a circuit, what's called a circuit split, split brewing. Um, but for now, links are okay. So if you're linking, you're not just copying um, the whole thing. So this is why a lot of times the library says link to our resources. So link to library um, subscription resources, right? Don't just upload the journal article, right? Link to it when you can. And we can help you with that if you don't know how to do it. Um, it's really easy to do in Canvas. So um, I put this in here because people don't understand that videos are a little bit different. Um, we do have streaming content. So we do have audio and video available streaming. This can be really helpful in an online class. Um, just look for it or contact a library and we can help you find it. Um, occasionally you can upload a video under fair use, but this is gonna be rare. And it, it's, it's gonna be rare, let's just know that. Um, so I, a lot of times people say, I have this in DVD, can I rip a copy and upload it? No. Um, in most cases, you can't, um, you're going to have to get a streaming license. And that's because the DVD, um, though you may buy and sell it, and you may make a copy for your personal use, um, actually uh, distributing it, copying it, and placing it online, that's considered actually a performance when the, it's a very weird thing. The law is weird, but it's considered a performance, and you don't have the rights. Um, to stream that unless you get the streaming. So even though you own it, you don't really own it. Um, you own it for your personal use, but not for all uses. Um, yes, you can use images you find online if they're openly licensed. So learn how to do that. I have some presentations um, and I'm sure that um, if you wanna contact me, I can sort of give you a quick rundown of how to do it. I do have some other videos I can share with you as well. So don't assume that anything you find online is uh, not covered by copyright because I guarantee you it is, unless you're pulling it from certain places. Okay, so there is a teaching exception, but it's only for face-to-face. -face. There's another exception called the Teach Act, which may help you out, but I don't generally talk about it because it's confusing and it's about equal to fair use. So I'm just gonna talk about fair use. Um, if you really want to learn more about it, contact me and I'll, I'll, I'll do another presentation just on Teach Act. But there is embedded into our copyright law this idea that if you're face to face teaching, you can use something without asking permission. So you can perform or display um, almost anything if you're face to face. And that doesn't mean online, it, it means face to face if you're standing in a classroom and they're there with you. Um, you, you can't use bootlegs for this. It's just written in. So you, it has to be a copy that um, you acquired lawfully. It's just written in there. Um, so now we're going to talk about fair use. And I'm going to look at, 
um, examples of copyright free data or text. Oh, text mining. Yeah, we'll cover. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, all data is going to be um, not protected by copyright. A lot of data is protected by license. So a lot of our databases, we um, are restricted to use um, and certain uses. And we try to get licenses that allow for certain kinds of use, but most companies are now excluding text and data mining. So before you text and data mine on library subscriptions, contact the library and make sure that we have it, that you can under the license, text or data mine. Um, and sometimes we have to get an additional license for that. It's not true in all countries. Um, the EU um, actually has it written in that you can text or data mine. You don't have to, um, actually they're, the companies are prohibited from excluding that. So that's one thing to think about. Um, even though I consider text and data mining to be fair use, um, remember that license control. So that, that's the deal with that. And um, so what is fair use? Okay, we're gonna rely on this really heavily because we are a nonprofit educational um, institution and our uses are usually for criticism and commentary, right? So we really like this fair use idea. Um, fair use is a right, it's an exemption, an exception. You don't have to get permission. You don't have to buy a license. You don't have to pay anybody anything, and it applies to all, all forms of work. Um, I'll say right now when it's not appropriate, uploading articles to Canvas usually isn't. Um, usually we either need to buy a license to do that, and I can do that for you. Um, the library has a small fund that we can pay for that. Um, and then also, um, uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm going to say about that. You you can occasionally rely on fair use, but it's under a really limited circumstances. So if you're uploading chapters or scholarly articles, um, you might want to contact me and see what I can do to help you make that a little bit more compliant. Um, remember that linking to library sources always good, or linking to open sources is always good. Now, of course, you can upload it if it's openly licensed. So that's one of the really great benefits of people um, publishing open access because then those kind of uses are accepted. So, um, and if it's any kind of work that's marketed um, for higher education use, yeah, please don't, please don't um, be uploading it because we, that's called a market substitution. And what you're doing is just trying to avoid um, student. And I know we wanna keep textbook costs low. That's why we need to find open educational resources we don't need to um, uh, infringe the textbook company's copyright. Yes, permalinks are totally okay. I'm answering Lisa's question. Permalinks are okay and embedded video is okay. Okay, wait, did I skip something? No. So there's four factors to fair use and you have to look at all of them and some are more important than others. I'm just doing an overview, but you have to assess fair use every single time you use something. So every semester you use something, um, every instance of it. You can't just think about it one time and then forget about it. Um, so we're looking at the purpose and character of your use. So how are you using it? What's the context? Is it used for to illustrate a point that you can't illustrate any other way? You need it for that reason. Um, or are you criticizing that thing itself? Um, that, and that's why you need it. Um, and then you're gonna look at the nature of the copyrighted work. So if it's something that is um, very factual, we consider that to have a thin copyright. Um, so if it's something that's very creative, that has a more rich copyright, it's more um, protected. Um, you're gonna look at the amount that you're using and how important it is in the context of the work. So if it's the heart of the work, um, then it's probably, um, it, that weighs against your fair use. And then finally, the most important factor that the courts have found is the effect on the, um, the market or the value. So if you're using something just to keep students from having to buy it, that's not gonna be a fair use. And it's as upsetting as that is, um, that's just the reality, which is, which is why we have to try to um, find resources for students that are openly licensed. Um, otherwise, if we can't license it in the library and provide a link to it, then, 
and we can't for most textbook materials. It's very, very difficult. The publishers don't want to deal with the library. They want the students to purchase the copies. Um, the only option really is for students to purchase the copies. And um, there's no kind of shortcut to that. So it, it is something that I always think about, but I'm kind of on both sides. I want, I want to use open materials to solve that problem rather than infringing copyright to solve that problem. I do like um, fair use and I want to expand it as much as we can, but there are limits. Um, so here's, uh, we have a copyright checklist that you can use. It's on my research guide and you can use it to kind of evaluate your use. Um, it has kind of like pros and cons. Um, and it, you can see it's everything I've already said, but um, um, generally with the amount of the work, um, there's no like, but sometimes people say guidelines are like, I can use 10% or 20% of a book um, or, um, I can use, you know, five seconds of a clip and all of those things are not really, um, they're not sort of legally based. They're just guidelines, right? So that could be true, um, but they might, it might still be infringement. So you really have to look at the totality. You have to look at it every single time. Um, clips are usually okay. So if it's a snip or a clip, that's usually okay, but that's a very small amount. Um, and then the courts have said about four to six percent of a book is um, sort of okay, but that's a lot less than most of the time people want to use. So just that's out there. Effect of the market, that's the biggest thing. If you can license it, that means that that's going to weigh against fair use. So if there's a market that exists for it, and let me tell you, there is a market that exists for almost everything now. You can, you know, there's micro licensing. And so just be very careful. So you can always request permissions. And sometimes it's easier to just ask permission and get permission than it is to go through the whole evaluation of fair use. Um, I'm just saying. Um, and really all you have to do, you don't have to have anything fancy. Just They have to just say, yeah, that's OK for you to use it. It can even be an oral agreement. Um, but I always say, get it in writing um, to protect yourself and as a record um, so you don't forget. Did I, do I have permission? I can't remember. Um, that's it. And now I'm gonna stop the recording and if I can do it, stop recording.